and welcome to the First Right Podcast, your weekly dose of conservative news brought to you by Restoration of America. I'm your host, Hayden Ludwig, Research Director for Restoration News. You can find our work at restoration-news.com. Today we're speaking with Doug Wilson, a pastor and leading theologian on America's coming revival and the rediscovery of Christian nationalism, the idea that spurred the creation of our republic in 1776. Doug is one of the finest minds of our time, and we're thrilled to have him on the show. Pastor Wilson, thank you for joining us. Happy to be here. Now, I think it's fair to say that you've become the leading exponent of what's called Christian nationalism. Now, of course, that's a phrase that the left has coined by gluing together the two things they hate most in the world, Christ and people who love their country. But you define it a bit differently. So, Pastor Wilson, what is Christian nationalism? Yeah, Christian nationalism is... Uh, the recognition that secularism has failed and that we are not in a position to govern ourselves without reference to God. Uh, b- basically, uh, the secular in, in post-World War II um, uh, legal history, the Warren Court uh, began the effort to sort of detach us from our Christian roots and uh, and they want they wanted to argue that we can be decent, law-abiding Americans, um, just take the lowest common denominator approach. We're, we're we're just all sensible people trying to get along, and we can we can do it. Well, if you look around for the last couple of years, it becomes obvious that we can't do it. We, uh, as I'm fond of saying, it's Christ or chaos. So, and we're we're seeing the chaos around us now. And so I, I believe that we need to return as a people to our Christian roots. This um, nation was founded by Christians. It was established by Christians in the Christian legal tradition. It was, a, uh, we were part of historic Christendom and that has been uh, un, unwound or walked back by revisionist historians who've wanted to say that uh, the founders were all deists, which is false. They, they were not. So let's talk about secularism. We've pointed out many times on this show, and I know you'll agree, secularism is not neutral. It's as much a religion as Islam or Christianity. So when we see those rainbow flags flying above the public school or the U.S. embassy, you know, that's a symbol of conquest and worship. That's a God that they're worshiping, even if it's a an unnamed secular God. Now, I think yes. Christians used to understand this, but they don't now. How did we get so fooled? Yeah. Um, well, you have to understand that the devil has been telling lies for a long time, and he's pretty good. <laughs> um, he is smarter than we are, and he he knows how to he knows how to lie. So. Uh, the basic lie here is that a historic word, secular, has been quietly and surreptitiously redefined. So, for example, in the medieval in the medieval church, the regular clergy were the uh, were the clergy who the the monks in the monasteries. They were the ones who lived uh, in accordance to a rule, regulus. So the monks in the monastery were doing that. The secular clergy were the priests out in re- in the in the regular um, uh, towns and villages and so forth, dealing with ordinary problems. So secular simply meant ordinary life as opposed to the dedicated monastic life. Sure. All right. Now, what happened is in the post World War II era that I'm talking about, the Earl Warren Court began to redefine secular as meaning godless. But secular does not mean godless. <laughs> secular does not mean atheistic. Uh, secular means the world of bicycle repair shops, uh, bakeries, schools, as opposed to the worship of God in the church where you're uh, uh, administer- preaching the word and administering the sacraments. So that that would be worship proper. And then the secular world is simply the ordinary world. 
Well, Christians believe that Christ is the Lord of ordinary world. He's, his lordship is not exercised in the same way, but he's as much lord of ordinary time as he is of uh, Sunday morning. Interesting. You know, in the opener, and you've mentioned this as well, we've talked about how America was founded along Christian and biblical principles. Um, I've actually described it as very much a Christian nationalist movement, even though, of course, that term is anachronistic. But the spirit of 1776 very much was no king but Jesus, a reference that, of course, that goes all the way back to the Puritan fathers, Oliver Cromwell, the English Civil War. It's, it's got a long, deep history in English Protestant thought. Do I have that right? It sounds like you would agree. Yes, very much. I would very much agree. And I would say that that extended well beyond the founding. So, for example, in, in 1892, uh, there was an exquisitely named Supreme Court case called Holy Trinity versus the United States of America. <laughs> which is kind of funny. Uh, uh, and as it happened, Holy Trinity won. Um, of course. Uh, Holy Trinity was a church in New York City, and uh, Congress had passed a law forbidding the importation of large numbers of laborers um, by corporations or companies where they paid their passage over, had them work on their project, and then just released them into the country. So there was a law against that. Well, there was a church in New York that called a British minister to be their minister, and they paid for his passage over, which technically was a violation of the law. The Supreme Court, this case went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme, Just, Chief Justice Brewer uh, uh, handled the decision, and the, the, the particular case that was before them, they handled it in a very common sense way and, and wisely and said Congress wasn't talking about that and they, they resolved that. But then Brewer said, now, now that you've got us on the subject, let me review for you why the United States is a Christian nation. And I've read, huh. this, dec I've, I've read this decision. He went back to the founding documents, the, the fundamental orders of Connecticut, and he walked through the history of the United States and said, we were and are a Christian nation. That was 1892. Now, uh, I was born in 1953, which, which means that that decision was closer to the day I was born than today is to the day I was born, right? <laughs> it, it, it wasn't that long ago. Mm. And, and so, and, and the other thing that's interesting to point out or helpful to point out is that in 1893, the year after that, it wasn't a totalitarian hellhole with all the women in red dresses doing the Handmaid's Tale thing. It was a, we were a free country and we were a free country that was operating in the Christian tradition. We, that we were a Christian people. And that was, uh, that even extended down as far as uh, FDR's um, presidency where, um, you know, whether you agree with his policies or not, politicians still felt free to refer to us as a Christian people. Uh, it was it was common knowledge. And it saying was, onward Christian soldiers with the troops in World War Two, for instance. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, now, after after the war, the courts began to surreptitiously and slowly and gradually change our definitions. And so the phrase, uh, the wall of separation uh, between church and state, that was a, a phrase that was that was uh, used by Thomas Jefferson in a letter that he wrote to the Danbury Baptists. And that phrase was hardly ever cited before the post-World War II era. And then it became commonplace. There's a wall of separation, wall of separation. And th this was done as a way of turning the of the turning the secular realm into an atheistic realm. They wanted the secular realm to be something that was consistent with Darwin, consistent with the atheist philosophers that was godless, Christ, Christless. But it wasn't that way before. We had a secular realm um, before this, but the secular realm was understood in its more historic sense of that word. So clearly, 
this print transformation from the secular to secularism, where the secular eats everything and the secular is indeed godless, was obviously a project of the 20th century left. We are clearly living at the very tail end of that project, more or less in the ruins of, of the civilization that that project tore down. Pastor Wilson, is it fair to say, though, that if America was a Christian nation in 1892, is it still a Christian nation in 2024? Yeah, there are bits and pieces of a Christian nation all over the place. Um, and there there are basically two Americas. Um, I, and, and we're accustomed to the red state, blue state, but it'd be um, a way of expressing it. I, I would say that, if, and it's also interesting if you take it down to county levels, red counties, blue counties, if you, if you look at blue counties, basically you're looking at those places in the United States that are like Europe without castles. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, the, basically the people there are very cosmopolitan, very secular. The, the population really is a secularist population in downtown Portland, in downtown mm -hmm. Seattle, in, uh, in LA, in, in Manhattan. Those are secularist strongholds. But the, um, there are the remainders, very uh, strong remainders of a Christian nation all over the country. And it's despised by the secular elites who dismiss it as flyover country um, you know, the, the, where the rubes and the cor corn bones live. But there's a, basically, um, the, the Americans are still a very religious people in the main. Okay. Um, but not in, but it's not evenly spread across urban, suburban, and rural areas. Interesting. So give us an idea of what a Christian nationalist revival in the United States right now would look like. What's the what's the objective there? If we are Christian nationalists, what are we trying to do in the public? Obviously, what are we trying to do in politics specifically? How does this relate to things like denominationalism and non-Christians in the United States? All right. So the first thing I would say that our, if someone said, what's your objective? As a Christian nationalist, what do you want? What do you want to get? Mm -hmm. what, what do you call success? Um, I would say my fundamental objective for us as Americans, as a Christian nationalist, would be to stop making God angry. <laughs> <laughs> a tall order. <laughs> but it would be things like, basically, the big ticket items for me were Ro Roe v. Wade, Mm -hmm. So I was very grateful to see that go down. But Roe v. Wade just kicked it back to the states. So now I would want to see um, uh, pro robust pro-life bills uh, in, um, established in all 50 states. Mm -hmm. Stop making God angry by killing the unborn. Yes. Uh, I, th I think we should stop making God angry with uh, things like Obergefell, um, the, um, the uh, attempt to sanctify uh, sodomite unions. I don't know, basically that, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah by fire from heaven for this sin. So we need to stop making God angry with that. We, we should stop it with the pride parades, stop it with the pride month. Why? Because pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before fall. Stop making God angry. Okay, that's the that's sort of the baseline. Um, uh, that, that that's how I would measure the first stage of of uh, success. Okay, so you stop making God angry. Is that begin with repentance? Where does Christ fit into this? Give us yeah. that gospel teaching there. Yeah, it, it, this is not going to happen. Uh, uh, this is something I said to Tucker in in, uh, um, in his interview uh, with me, and that is. I believe that politics, I didn't put it exactly this way, but I believe that politics is no savior, but politics needs to be saved. Politics is not our savior. We're not going to, we're not going to vote our way out of this. All right. Um, there has to be a massive 
revival, Reformation and revival, where all of Judea turns out to go see John the Baptist and be baptized by him in the Jordan. It's got to be a, a baptism of repentance. God, we've made you angry. We, we can't uh, appease you by simply stopping. There needs to be blood atonement, and that, and that is accomplished by looking to Christ on the cross. Um, we repent of our sins. We acknowledge that we've been extraordinarily ungrateful. Um, if there was ever a generation of people, if there was ever a nation that won the jackpot, uh, it would be the United States of America in, in terms of our, our extraordinary resources, our extraordinary history, our extraordinary wealth, our harbors, our rivers, our farmlands, our, our minerals, our, the energy in the ground. We would, we would have to work hard to not be wealthy. <laughs> now, we're doing it. We're good. <laughs> sort of, sort of the can-do American spirit. We're okay. Watch us, watch us go. But yes, God, watch us vote for the Green New Deal. Right, exactly. Um, so, uh, God has been extraordinarily kind to us, and we have despised those gifts. Uh, it's all in Deuteronomy. Uh, I gave you, I gave you wealth upon wealth. I gave you all these things. And you, then you've said, my power and the and the work of my hand has gotten me this wealth. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we need to repent of that sin. And we need to turn to Christ. And we need to name him uh, as the one we're turning to. So the first thing would be preachers of the gospel articulating the need for this corporate repentance and faith in pulpits all across the country. That's the first place. The, the reason the country's in the mess it's in is because the pulpits have been silent. Okay, we, um, yes. preachers, preachers need to articulate the gospel. They pre need to preach law and gospel. And I like to put it this way. They, we need to preach cold law and hot gospel. And, <laughs> uh, and th that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, when the people turn back to God, uh, this will have an impact on our politics. Politics will not be the savior, but politics will be saved. And mm -hmm. uh, and that's one of the, uh, I, I actually see God's kindness to us in the, in the chaos that is being inflicted on our political processes. If, um, you know, I, and by this chaos, I mean Trump, the wrecking ball. I mean, Biden falling apart. I mean, the chaos in the Democratic Party. I mean, all the, the scoundrels and the cheating and everything. Um, if we had put a, if we had gotten our act together very modestly and quietly during Eisenhower's administration, at the end of it, we might have taken credit for it ourselves. Oh, good to see that we cleaned ourselves up a bit. Well, God is ensuring that when if, if we get out of this alive, um, Nobody will think it's because we had our act together. I mean, this, these are these are this is clown world. We really are in clown world, and if if God spares us, it will be despite all the folly. So there's, and I want to get into going back to how far down this this rot goes. But I want to answer two obvious objections that I know people are screaming to ask about. The first one is from other Christians. What is there going to be a state church in your Christian nationalist America is the first objection we always hear. Uh, the second one, though, is what if I'm not a Christian? What happens to me in this, you know, hellish, this Christian, Protestant, reformed hellscape that you're trying to create here, Pastor Wilson? So tell us what those two, the answers to those objections. OK, the first the first answer is that uh, the separation of church and state as two distinct governments is a Christian invention mm -hmm. okay that's our baby we we're the ones that came up with that um but it, because you can separate church and state because they are two forms of governance among men over different areas of human life over different areas of human existence the church is the ministry of grace and peace or the ministry of word and sacrament and the and the state is the ministry of justice the state's job is to make it possible for me to walk across town safely at two in the morning. That's that's their job, the Ministry of Justice. And I can 
I can keep those two things separate because they're both the same kind of thing. They're both governments, right? Um, just like I can keep apples and oranges separate because I've got two bowls and I, and I put the apples in one bowl on the counter and the oranges in the other bowl on the counter. They're both fruit and I can keep them distinct. Mm -hmm. But keeping, keeping uh, the state and morality separate is a different thing. That's like keeping apples and freshness separate. Okay. In other words, do you sure. think, about, think about this for a moment. Do you really want to live in a nation where the state is entirely separated from all moral considerations? <laughs> well, some people are trying to do that. They're trying but to of do course that. They can't really achieve that at all, right? Yeah, because as soon as you say, "Well, I'm I'm good with the government being as a, as immoral as they want to be," well, <laughs> nobody wants to say that. But as soon as you say, "I want the state to be moral," the next obvious question is, "By what standard? What standard of morality?" Now, I'm arguing that it has to be Christian morality, but Christian morality is not dependent upon. Uh, the establishment of a state church. But let me interrupt you and point out that the secular left's the secular left does not have an objective morality by definition, right? But they right. act as if they do, which of course is a principle that they got from Christian thinking, Christian culture around them, right? So you can see this in the Biden administration when they call something good or evil. Well, how can you call it good or evil if you don't have any measuring stick by which to actually name something good or evil? Right. The, the progressive left, they're, they are fundamentalists without a fundament. <laughs> <laughs> That's because, precisely because right. They will come after you as fiercely and as ferociously as persecuting priests in the Spanish Inquisition. They will, they will destroy you. They will come after you shrilly you know, and take you out, take you down. But they don't have any standard. They're just doing it arbitrarily, capriciously. So... Mm -hmm. um, that's the so separation of church and state is something that I'm in favor of, particularly at the federal level. In the first in the First Amendment, it says Congress shall make no law concerning the establishment of religion. They were simply saying they did not want a Church of the United States the way there's a Church of England or a Church of Denmark. Mm -hmm. And the reason they didn't want one is because uh, at the time of the adoption of the Constitution, Nine of the 13 colonies had formal relationships with the Christian, did not one Christian denomination or another. In Connecticut, the Congregational Church was the established Church of Connecticut down into the 1830s. Now, and this is a, there's an important distinction here. I happen to be opposed to church establishment at the state level also. But I'm opposed to it as a political matter, as a theological and political matter. Uh, I think it's a bad idea. Uh, it's a kiss of death to whatever denomination that is. Look uh, at Germany, it, for instance. It, it's just not it's just not a good way to go. Yes. But even though it's not a good idea, it's not an unconstitutional idea, <laughs> right? Um, at the time the Constitution was adopted, a bunch of the states had these formal relations with Christian denominations. What I would prefer to see is for the state to recognize formally and judicially that Jesus rose from the dead and that we are a Christian people and that we're gonna govern ourselves in accordance with the word of God without any tax support going to any Christian denomination, whatever. So I believe in the separation of church and state. I think it's a good, healthy policy. And I think it's a Christian it's a Christian theological development that gave us that. So if people are worried about the Church of the United States or the Church of Idaho cracking down on them, I'm, I'm not advocating that at all, okay? This, your second question was, what about non-believers? What, what about the atheist? What about, you know, what about the person who doesn't um, buy into all of this? Or what about the Hindu who wants to, immigrate here and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, in a, and we're fast forwarding, obviously, 500 years. If you're asking me what my ideal Christian republic would look like, I would say that the uh, visiting Muslim and the visiting Hindu and the, and the local atheist would have more rights 
respected by the government than they have currently in their countries in 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 yes in in uh for the citizen let's say the citizen of the united states who comes to atheistic conclusions i believe that he would have his rights uh as an image bearer of god respected more um thoroughly by people who believed in the image of god than atheistic societies would respect me so in other words a muslim in a christian nationalist country would enjoy greater safety safeguards civil liberties might flourish far more than a christian in a muslim nation at any point in time do i have that right absolutely and i think the muslim here would have more practical freedoms than he would back in his home country <laughs> so so uh, now there there would be someone's going to say there's going to be well, what what aren't there any distinctions at all? Well, yeah. Um, so to, one of my favorite examples is uh, church bells would be perfectly okay, but um, but minarets, Muslim pra prayer towers would not because they're filling the public space. Church ah. church bells uh, are public uh, in public. But the prayer tower, I'd say no. And if someone says, well, that's totalitarian, I'd say, well, that's what Switzerland just did. <laughs> um, yes, um, that famous dystopia, Switzerland. That's that right. Dystopia, Switzerland. <laughs> because one of the things that we are uh, guilty of doing is, is we assume that everybody's a secularist, just scratch the surface, and everybody's a secularist down underneath. But that's simply not the case. And and because the secularists have assumed that you can just sort of mix and match people, you can uh, import hundreds of thousands of uh, immigrants, um, refugees from the Middle East into Europe and not have a problem, or you can have chaos on the southern border of the United States and not have a problem, uh, shows how uh, myo myopic and how um, much in the grip of their faith, their religion, they are. They, they're they humanists, and they think these are all humans, so let's just throw throw them together, and they're all going to get along. Well, you just look at the events of, in France in the in the recent elections. There is serious blowback because the, the secularist approach to ethnic relations and ethnic harmony and refugees and borders is simply false. Well, and of course, a lot of these are Christian led. And even for the ones that are not in Europe, I'm talking about, you know, they're they're pleading for a common culture to re to preserve that common culture, say, of France or Denmark or anything. And of course, we know, well, even that is religious. The root word of culture is cult, is to worship, right? You can't right. escape these things. I mean, what right. even is the idea of Europe if you don't have Western Christendom, Christianity uniting all of these different nations, what are they? You have this hollow EU, which is united by its humanism, also a religion. Do I have that right? He's exactly right. So basically, someone's going to say, well, see, Wilson, you're being, you're anti-immigrant. I'm not an anti-immigrant at all. I'm, I'm uh, grateful for Im immigrants who come, but they have to come at a rate where they can be assimilated, because if it, um, if they're not assimilated, what you're doing is simply sowing future chaos. Um, assimilation is, so someone's going to say, um, uh, you know, on the anti-immigrant thing, the illustration I use is, let's say a Christian couple is, foster, is uh, their foster parents to three kids, and they've got two kids of their own, and they're doing a great job with the three kids. And then one day a bus shows up from Human Services and drops 28 new foster kids uh, off and the dad protests and and then he's accused of being anti-foster children. Well, no, he, <laughs> he was already taking care of three foster children. And his argument is when you when you accuse me of being anti-foster children and you drop 28 new ones off before I was taking care of three of them very well. Now I'm not taking care of anybody. Mm hmm. Okay, now, now you've blown the whole thing to smithereens. So um, I, I have no objection to immigrants from Mexico, from the UK, from Africa. I have no objection to immigrants. I just think it has to be done in an orderly 
way where the people there's certain requirements there's a certain bar to uh, uh, clear and the people are committed to assimilating and 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 you've got to uh, go at a reasonable pace in order for that to happen so the people who just opened the floodgates and said everybody come on in uh, that was a deliberate destructive move well, and it's not just open the floodgates. I mean, numbers are a huge part of it right now. Uh, maybe 12 million plus illegal aliens at the southern border, for instance. But it's also that the people who opened the floodgates are multiculturalists, which is the opposite of that old melting pot idea we all grew up with, where the idea is you come as you are and you stay as you are, no matter where you live within our borders, rather than the old idea of you're going to come from a million different places, but this is what an American looks like and thinks and believes. We want you to, to ultimately come to conform to that and assimilate into that. So you have this dual problem of millions of these people and they're not being told, well, frankly, what is an American anymore and what should I assimilate into under the left? Right. And and the, the by sowing the seeds of this kind of ethnic chaos, they've made the fire so hot that the melting pot itself is going to melt, <laughs> uh, and when the, and when that happens, uh, you don't have anything that's going to be a blessing to anyone. Uh, you're not taking care of any of the foster kids anymore. Everyone everyone loses. Let's go back historically for a moment. You know, you've you've been talking about actually how dire things became beginning in the 1950s, and um, everybody has this rosy picture of how wonderful the 1950s were. Uh, the left likes to say only if you were white male Christian. But you're pointing out the Supreme Court in the 1950s already was beginning this secular tidal wave that has now swamped us in the 2020s. Um, right. I, I know you've pointed out before that trying to go back to a happier time, like, I don't know, 1980 is a little bit like going from terminal cancer to stage three cancer. Obviously, yeah. there's a deeper problem going on here. Right. Tell us what you mean by that. Yeah, so another illustration I use is if you if you rented a movie and you start at 15 minutes in, you thought this this movie stinks, you wouldn't go back to the beginning and try again, <laughs> right? <laughs> because the, the movie's going to do the same thing uh, the second time over. Um, yeah. When you, So if you said, if, when someone says, well, the 50s and 60s were, were great if you were, you know, um, white suburban, you know, you grew up in that sort of thing. I'd say no, um, they were way better for blacks in America. That you know, How many black children are growing up today without a dad, mm. right? And who did that? So- Margaret um, Sanger. Yeah, yeah. So yes. There's, and, and, but here's the other thing, um, our welfare policies have done that. Let's say a young teenage black girl in the inner city gets pregnant, um, and she has a choice between marrying the dad or the federal government will come in and give her welfare benefits. She gets all the benefits which are worth more financially than what the father can bring in. And so the government basically says, if you marry him, you forfeit these benefits. So the government competes with the father of the child. But if you if you want a predictor of future criminality, if you want a predictor of future uh, gang membership or time in the penitentiary, fatherless boys would be a good way to go. That's one of the prime indicators. And and fatherless boys is is the creation of our do gooding welfare state. Um, it's just appalling what slavery couldn't do, what Jim Crow couldn't do. Uh, destroy the black family, LBJ's Great Society did. Wow. Devastating. And it's obvious that a lot of this corruption has started in the church. You know, it's not like this is the first time the devil has played a trick on us or attempted to destroy Christian people. But he's only succeeded so far, it seems to me, that because the pastors in this country don't want to, well, they always say, introduce politics into their church. You know, it's the line you always hear. I just want to preach the gospel. Um, are they correct in their fears, Pastor Wilson? Yeah. Um, what they, the, when people say they want to keep it gospel-centered, 
Um, of course, no Christian could be opposed to keeping the gospel at the center. But that's not our problem. The problem is where's the circumference? Okay, how far how far out does the circle go? When you say that you want to be gospel centered, I'd say, well, central to what exactly? C the center of what? So, yeah. um, and then when you go out toward the circumference of people's lives, how far out to to the circumference can people sin? Can they can they sin in their politics? Can they sin in their artwork? Can they sin in um, their sexual practices, can they, yeah, right? So if you're going to preach a gospel, which is the gospel of the kingdom, which is how it's expressed in the gospels, the, uh, the message is repent and believe for the kingdom, for the kingdom is at hand. Well, repent of what? Right? There's, there's absolutely no way to preach the gospel in a society like ours, unless you're willing to, as the jo old preacher's joke goes, leave off preaching and get to meddling. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, a lot of people, a lot of Christians like preachers who really go to town, but then if the preacher starts to meddle, um, uh, they, they start to not like it. There's another joke about the old country preacher who, preached on heaven and hell every week, heaven and hell, heaven and hell, heaven and hell. Someone once finally said, why do you preach on heaven and hell every week? And he said, well, I did preach on chicken stealing once, but it dampened the enthusiasm. <laughs> 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 uh, so uh, what we have to do is there's no way for the gospel center to confront Americans where they live unless we adopt a Kuyperian approach to the word of God where we recognize that Jesus is Lord over every human endeavor. Mm, that's right. Because in every human endeavor, we sin there and we need to be forgiven there. And we need to be taught how to obey everything that the Lord Jesus had left for us, has left for us to do. So basically the issue is not gospel centered. The issue is the fact that they have a tiny gospel that they want to be, to occupy a tiny church with a tiny circumference. No. So many of these pastors want you to think Christianly about your finances, right, or your marriage, which are good things, of course, but not Christianly about your politics or the way we vote or the people we do vote to be our leaders. It seems pretty clear. But right. I want to talk a little bit as we close out here, last couple of questions here. Um, you are a post-millennialist. I'd like you to, first of all, tell the audience what that means, but also that's an optimistic theology. It's very central, I think, to how Christian nationalists view the future. Can you link these things together for us? Yeah, I'll start by saying that not all Christian nationalists are post mill, but That's a lot right. of them, uh, it's, it's, they don't have to, they go together, I think more like peanut butter and jelly or ham and eggs than they do <laughs> um, triangles having three sides. It's not, it's not absolutely necessary. But, it's, it, but it is a very common factor in Christian nationalism. And basically, this is a very short explanation, but in if you take the millennium, which is mentioned in one place in the Bible, in Revelation 20, and the joke is the millennium is a thousand years of peace that Christians like to fight about. <laughs> so <laughs> um, the three, posi three main positions are pre-mill, amill, and post-mill. And those prefixes um, tell you where that position places the second coming of Christ with regard to the millennium. So the premillennialist, most American evangelicals are pre-mill. The premillennialist believes that Jesus is going to return prior to the millennium and he will usher in the millennium. Okay, the amillennialist, that ah there is a term of negation and it basically says we don't believe in an earthly millennium. We believe in a spiritual millennium with the saints of God ruling with Christ in the heavenly places. So amillennialism is a no literal earthly millennium. The postmillennialism, which is my position, is that the millennium is brought in by gospel preaching, church planting, missionary efforts, and 
Christ is going, there's going to be the, the Great Commission will be successfully fulfilled on earth. This will enter, this will usher in a golden age, and at the end of which Christ will return. So Christ will return post millennially. Now, and if I can, Christ will yeah. return bodily, but we yes. will not be raptured before any kind of millennial tribulation. Do I have that right? Correct. In the pre the common pre mill view is Christ returns and raptures the Christians out. There's a seven year tribulation, and then the then Christ returns all the way, and you have the millennium. For the post millennialists, Christ returns bodily at the end of the millennium, but there's no secret rapture, nothing like that. Right. Now, um, all three of these positions, pre, ah, uh, and post, are optimistic when you're if you factor in um, the the day of resurrection. Everybody who believes in heaven believe, is optimistic, <laughs> right? right. So we win every, at the end. Every yes. Christian who believes in the resurrection of the dead is optimistic. But post-millennial thinking is optimistic about the course of human history prior to the second coming of Christ. In other words, uh, post-millennialists believe that it's possible for us to win here now, okay? Um, instead of the common view, which is down here we lose, all right? Um, so that's the, that's the position. So consequently, if the Christian nationalist wants uh, the nation to repent and turn to Christ, the post-millennialist believes that that's actually a possibility. That's actually something that is in the cards. Interesting. So, you know, for our, our closing question here, there are millions of Christians in this country, many of them listening in right now, who are terrified of this, let's call it a Soviet future that we're staring down right now. Here in 2024, it looks like this kind of future is inevitable. And of course, it always does right before the whole evil empire collapses. Many people think the end of the United States is nigh. Many people believe the rapture is going to rescue us out of this if we're lucky. What do you have to say to those Christians? And secondly, what should they be praying for and doing right now? Um, yeah, uh, I would quote G.K. Chesterton, who uh, once said that Christianity has died many times. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but he says Christianity has died many times. But that's all right, because Christianity serves a God who knows the way out of the grave. Mm -hmm. um, we, we are not, um, I, I, I think we should be very cheerful, upbeat, and op optimistic about the future. And the reason is, in the long run, stupidity is not a strategy. Stupidity is not sustainable. In the long run, stupidity doesn't work. If, if someone said, I'm going to, I'm, I bought this ranch where I've got 10,000 uh, 10, uh, cattle and I'm going to treat all the bulls like cows and all the cows like bulls. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm no businessman. I'm no farmer. I, I didn't major in ag anything, but I can tell you who's going out of business. I'd love to see that on a loan application, by the way. Yes. Right. We're going to we're going to have an equity. We're uh, this is called equity ranching, um, <laughs> DEI ranching or, or tranny ranching. Um, now, uh, these these great developments they had with the whole transsexual movement, they 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 didn't develop these in the vet schools. Right. It wasn't it wasn't something they figured out how to do with with cows and bulls. You can you can ma you can make a steer. Um, and you can take a man and make him a eunuch, but you but you can't make him a woman, right? That's that's outside of our reach. So consequently, people who are doubling down on that kind of thing, all I all I can say to my fellow Christians is, look at that, stare at that straight on, look at that that uh, clerk at at Safeway, who's a tranny and all done up like who knows what, and tell yourself clearly that is not the future. And know that they're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. They know it's a lie. They're, they want you to swallow the lie and repeat it back to them 
with all of this public pressure. That's really the point. You can't change reality, but you can change the way people talk and respond to power, right? Right. And but you can't keep it from being lame. And uh, and I've I've noticed something this last June. We're just out of June. Um, this last June was the most rainbow flag free month we've had in a, quite a while. It was. Uh, all right. Uh, this isn't. It's not working. It's not working. It's not catching on. It's now. Now there's fomenting a lot of chaos and a lot of turmoil. I do believe that we're on a stretch of nine miles of bad road. I'm not trying to be, you know, this is going to be tumultuous, but I don't think it's apocalyptic end of the world tumultuous. I, I, I really believe that we're in a position to do some very good things, Lord willing, within my lifetime. We've read the book and we know we win at the end. Pastor Wilson, so extraordinarily enlightening. Thank you for your time and joining us tonight. Yeah, happy to be with you. Thank you. And let me thank you folks for tuning in and supporting conservative voices like Pastor Wilson's that are working to expose the truth about the rot spreading through this once great country. Remember that it's only by working together and by praying together that we can restore the United States of America to greatness under almighty and sovereign God. I'm Hayden Ludwig. Join us next time as the battle rages on. First Right, a new kind of news summary without the liberal slant. Every morning, in your inbox, always free. Subscribe by texting First Right to 30161. That's First Right, all caps, one word, to 30161.